Okay. So can you see this now? Yep. Presentation, the picture. Okay. Um, so, well, I want to thank Nancy for putting together the slides. I said I would present it, but um, Nancy is going to jump in and ask me questions if there's something I didn't talk about that she wanted me to talk about. Right, Nancy? <laughs> um, Karen is the expert. Um, I just, she has so much on her plate. So I put together the, the, uh, the slides, but she really is the one that has all the information. So uh, yes, I will. Definitely, I I'm always asking her questions. I'm sure I'll have more. <laughs> and it's open to the audience too. Yeah. That's the uh, way. Yeah, so yeah, go ahead and, and ask questions as I go. If you wanna unmute or, or write something in the chat, I'll try to. So are you looking at my chat too, or do I have to? I can, I can monitor the chat, Karen. Okay, I just didn't know if you see my chat or. Um. So um, anyway, so we, we do a lot of seed collection here on the refuge and um, there's just people that might not know what we're doing, why and, and how. So I want to talk about that. Um, so what we, what we usually do with the seed we collect is we uh, plant it in other places on the refuge. So we have uh, for example, this year uh, during the winter, sometime we're gonna we have about forty acres. I think that we're planting um, a new well, maybe it's more than that. A new parcel uh, that we're planting, and there's probably some other places where we'll overseed. We're starting to do that some um, because we aren't acquiring land as quickly as we were in the early days. So there's some places with just brome that's been growing there since before the refuge and we want to diversify that. Um, so we, I usually pick out the, the species that I want to collect based on, you know, well, it depends on <laughs> what's ready at a given time, but I'm looking for to target species that we don't get in our bulk harvest. So I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we, we combine part of the prairie to get just a good mix of species. And then, um, but, but that's only what was ripe on that day that it was harvested. So it just harvests whatever is there. Um, so for example, spiderwort is ready in July and it, we're not combining in July. So if we wanna get that, we, we go out and hand collect it. Um, we have a system of uh, our biology crew goes out there and finds places where there's a lot of seed of a certain species that we're going to want to collect and we can mark that in a we have now instead of a GPS unit, we can do it on an iPad um, with an app and just uh, mark locations so we can find them again later. Um, so if it's a big it's a big patch of something, or if it's something really rare that we don't have very much of, we might mark just an individual plant that we find. Um, and yeah, we're just looking mostly for the prairie species. We do have, you know, savanna and overgrown savanna, which is woodlands. We don't, and, and some wet places, but we don't, aren't really planting in that kind of situation. So we're just mostly trying to get the the prairie species. Okay, uh, this is the combine uh, that we use to harvest the prairie. It's really big and it only gets run once every year or two. <laughs> Um, so it's a lot of maintenance. Um, and this, this head on it is a rice head and it's actually too big to fit inside our garage doors in our maintenance building. So we have to take it off the combine and put it in um, when we store it, put it in on this little trailer thing. So it's just, it's really a big, <laughs> a big obnoxious piece of equipment, but it's really good at <laughs> <the library. laughs> um, this is a dryer. We actually have some bigger ones, but uh, they just, we 
turn them on when we after we harvest the, the with the combine we unload it into one of these dryers it just blows air through it to uh, to dry out the seeds so it doesn't get moldy for the first few days or so and then we store it in these big bins um, these these each have like six to eight hundred pounds of seed in them I think uh, well it's not and it's not all seed it's a bulk harvest so it includes a lot of uh, chaff, you know, stems, leaves, that kind of stuff is all in there. Um, and what we do is we uh, send a, a sample to the seed lab and they uh, let us know how much of it is actually seed and what species are in the sample, at least. It doesn't tell us all the species in the whole mix, but um, just the prevalent species. And then we have them uh, do a viability test on on the, the most common species. So we get an idea of how much is actually going to grow. Um, so with the hand collected seed, um, yeah, these are species that might not be harvested with the, the bulk mix. And they're not, they're usually species that aren't as widespread or they bloom at different times. Um, so the seed is ready at different times. Um, and we're trying to uh, have a diverse mix when we plant. So uh, we want to just get as many different species in there as possible. So this is an example. It looks like showy goldenrod. Um, so some of this, some of the seed when we collect it is not completely dry either. Either conditions were damp, like it was dewy or rainy. Um, or it was just green, and so there's some moisture in there. Um, so behind behind her is the uh, seed dryer, and so so sometimes we'll put seed. This is for the hand collected stuff. Um, I'm not sure who made this, but I think it was a volunteer way back when the refuge started before I was here. Um, and it's pretty neat. It's got these little drawers with screens in the bottom. So um, you can just put a whole bunch of, you know, just small batches of seed in there and turn it on and it dries it. Um, when we bring the seed in, if it doesn't go in the dryer, it'll, so this, these are the, the wooden uh, boxes here are the drawers that go in the seed dryer. Um, but other seed will just go in these pans. Uh, to dry and then um, we label them with information about where it came from, what species it is, where it came from, when it was collected, and who collected it. And that's mostly just for, for my information so I can ask somebody if I have a question about it, um, you know, exactly where they were when they collected it. Um, and we can, okay, I was telling Nancy, in theory, we can trace the seed back to the, a remnant. I have never actually tried to do this, but um, we could, because um, all the seed was originated um, from a remnant somewhere in southern, the southern half of Iowa in about 38 counties. 39 counties, depending on which <laughs> list you look at. Um, and uh, so even the, the seed that we purchase from, from growers, we ask them for the location of the original remnant. So, so we, we have that information. Um, and now we do so much in the early days of the refuge a lot of the seed collection was taking place off the refuge in remnants where we had permission to collect seed and now we have so much on the refuge that we're collecting it from planted seed so it's several generations away from the the original remnant but um we could still trace it back if we ever needed to do that <laughs> And the, the reason for having the local ecotype is just so the seed is um, adapted to the conditions we have here in terms of the soils and the climate. Um, and even though that climate is changing, if we have a lot of diversity, um, the 
of genetics, then the species are more, the plants are more likely to be able to adapt to changes. Um, this shows um, some indigo that was collected and put in the freezer. So indigo has, it gets weevils, which is a native species of weevil. I don't know the name of the species, but, um, and they are, they'll eat a lot of the seeds. Um, a lot of times we can't even find seeds in the pods when they're out in the field, but um, some plants just get missed uh, or some pods get missed and we get some seed out of it. And then we put them in the freezer to kill off those weevils so they don't keep eating the seed once it's in the seed lab. Uh, we usually just put them in there for a day or two uh, and that's enough to kill off the weevils. And then a lot of the species, uh, you know, each species has slightly different ways of cleaning it, but a lot of things we just sift um, so we can kind of separate some of the seed from the non-seed in there. There might be leaves and stems or dust or pods or whatever. So um, these sieves are really good at, at sorting that kind of thing. We also have, oops, we also have a Dakota blower, which uh, blows air, a column of air up and it separates heavier from lighter material. So um, usually, well, it depends on the species. Usually the, the heavier stuff is the seed and the lighter stuff is not. So you can separate them that way. Um, and then, what was it? oh, we use things like um, rolling pins to smash things up, um, break, break up. Uh, you can see in this picture, there's a, a pan of uh, echinacea seed heads. So that's the kind of thing we really want to break apart so that the seeds are separated. So it's not just one big ball of, of seed going out there when we plant it. And then this is a, a hammer mill, which uh, we have up at the shop uh, and it's just an electric powered motor and we run the seed through there. And this, this is the kind of thing like the echinacea seed heads can go through there and it just beats them up and separates them. It's, um, it has some screens in there and we don't wanna you know, make flour out of it. So you, you have to use a pretty big size screen. It's just to, to separate things and basically breaks it up. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is one way to use a rolling pin. Um, some things we actually roll this, this was, um, I think rose hips and they were just, uh, using the, the rolling pins to just beat them up to smash them. Um, we could also probably use the hammer mill on this, but they're so hard. Um, but it, it works pretty well actually with the rolling pins. <laughs> um, and then a lot of the, uh, a lot of species, it's just separating by hand, like the, getting the seeds um, separated from the stems. A lot of the fluffy things like asters, um, you just want to kind of break them up uh, by hand. Um, and we do get, uh, we really rely on volunteers to do this. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult and it's kind of fun, especially when there's other people around, other, you know, the last year and a half. <laughs> we haven't done a whole lot of things with a lot of people. So um, I'm not sure when we'll be back to having uh, seed cleaning parties at the refuge. But uh, if we are going to uh, probably have people, if you're interested, take a batch of seed home. We did that a little bit this year because uh, we didn't have a lot of seed, but, but people were able to, we will check it out to you with whatever tools you might need to clean it. and. People can take it home and clean it. Um, and, you know, we really don't have to. And, and you know, sometimes it's just fun to make it just so it's just pure clean seed. We don't really have to make it just seed. It's mostly just so it, it will be in small enough pieces that we can run it through our seed spreader. And we also want to get an idea of how much of what we're putting out there is seed. So if we don't clean it, then that means we have to 
Well, I'll show you. <laughs> I think that's coming up here pretty soon. <laughs> we have to figure out what percentage of it is seed. Um, so yeah, here's another group um, cleaning seed one winter a couple years ago. And so here's where we weigh the seed. And um, so we'll, we'll weigh the whole batch and then take a little sample. And what I'm doing there is uh, separating the seeds from the other stuff in there and, and trying to check if the seeds are actually filled seed too, instead of just oh, flat ones. Um, and then I can weigh that. I weigh the whole sample and then I weigh the amount that's actually seed and I get a percentage of that batch that is seed. This part is pretty tedious. <laughs> that's why it's a little more fun to just clean the seed. Um, yeah, and here's another one um, separating the, the seeds out. Um, and then when we get uh, finished, we uh, label the seed, we enter it in a database, and um, it has a barcode and uh, the information of the, the species and the um, lot number is on there, and then we, we can reference the database to find out more information about that particular batch of seed. Um, we do number them by the year, so we can just look at them and know that this, this one was collected in 2015, that one was collected in 2016, so. Um, yeah. And then a lot of this, so this, this is um, stratifying the seed, so we're mixing a lot of the species need some kind of treatment before they can grow. So if we're just planting them outside in the field, if we, as long as we plant them in the, uh, you know, in the winter or early spring, they'll go through a cold treatment and they will, uh, you know, do, do that through natural um, exposure to the elements. If not, then uh, if we're growing them in the greenhouse, then we have to force them through that, uh, some kind of cold treatment. So uh, especially seeds that need cold, moist treatment, we use sand, we get it uh, damp, and then we mix that with the seeds at about 50-50 sand to seed. And then they'll, uh, they'll when then we put them in the refrigerator. Um, there's some that need a cold dry treatment. So for those, we, we can just put them in our cold storage area, which is just during the winter, they're just gonna get cold and that's all they need. Um, is there a picture of a... <laughs> so some need uh, scarification, which means that uh, the seed coat gets nicked and we have a little machine for that can do that for things like the legumes, like um, indigo and um, purple prairie clover, that kind of thing. Um, and then, it, the, so if we're starting them in the greenhouse, we'll start them in, usually starting around February, we'll start planting them. And then um, they, they'll germinate, some things germinate within a couple of days, some it takes a week or two before they, they start growing. And then once they get their true leaves, it takes usually a couple of weeks maybe to, to get their true leaves and then we'll transplant them into individual containers. Um, and when we plant them, we just sprinkle the seed on top of the growing medium. So we just get that wet and then spread the seed on top. If there are really large seeds, like compass plant has pretty big seeds, we, we would cover that up just so the seeds remain moist. Um, and then this is the transplanting process. We use pencils <laughs> as dibbles so we can um, kind of make a hole with that and then lift the roots out of the tray and poke it in the hole. Um, so yeah, and these, so these containers allow the plants to grow as individuals um, where they have more room. They don't have to compete with the other plants and then they, um, they can get a really deep root system going. 
Um, and the, here's a picture that shows the what once you pull it out of the container, you should have just a, a nice, good, healthy root system there. And um, we use a dibble to make a hole to plant them. Usually we're planting uh, plants that we started the previous year. So we, um, like if we started seed this, this winter, we would probably not plant them until 2023 let them outside, but it depends um, on the plant. We, we can make them grow faster. <laughs> we, we've been using fertilizer and they do develop their root system a lot faster. So we could plant them. But the problem is it's usually like the middle of summer before they're really ready to go. And then it's not the best time for planting out in the prairie. Um, yeah, and here's some plants ready to plant in the prairie. Uh, we, and we have volunteers help with that too. Um, and then if we're planting them in the um, in a crop field like this, uh, this is the seed spreader we use. It's just a broadcast spreader and um, it just we have to calibrate the seed. Uh, we usually mix it with something like sawdust to sort of cut back on the amount that comes out so it doesn't all come out in one spot. <laughs> Um, and then we, we generally plant in, uh, in a field the, the year, you know, the winter after it's been uh, harvested for the last time. And it's usually soybeans. This, this picture actually shows planting in corn stubble, which that works too. Some, some people have had better success. We haven't done it that much here, but it's, there's more litter on the ground with the, the corn stubble. So that's the disadvantage. The, the species might have it, not have as much, um, sorry. The seeds might not have as much contact with the bare ground. Um, yeah, and so the, the goal is to just plant as diverse a prairie as we can get uh, with a lot of uh, prairie species out there uh, that will help uh, with the, wildlife and and just create a healthy ecosystem. So we have about, and I did not look this up. <laughs> so just, we have a, about 600 species of plants on the refuge, but they're not all prairie plants. So I think it's about 200 to 250 species of prairie plants on the refuge. And they're not all growing in any one place, but there's different, different ones in different areas. Different. <laughs> So if there are any questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, Karen, Mark, Lyle, you made a comment, 250 species of plant, pr prairie plants, but there's a 600 other species. What are the other species? Are they just weeds or? No, I mean, there's, there's um, well, some of them are weeds. <laughs> some of them are uh, like, growing in the oak savanna, they're woodland species, they're wetland species. Um, and then there's some that, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to say what is a prairie species and what is not, because there's some species that'll grow just about anywhere. So they'll they they do grow in the prairie, but they'll grow other places too. So that's also, why it's sort of a vague number. I'm not sure exactly how many I would say were prairie plants. Also, one other quick question. When you combine for seed, do you, do you try to s separate the species after you combine or just, just a, because it saves the bulk? It stays, yeah, it stays mixed up. Okay. Yeah. The only separating that's done is by the, the seed lab that's looking at the little sample and they'll try to figure out how many of each uh, species is in there. Karen, this is Dan again. Hi. Hi. Do you ever use heated air or you just strictly use uh, ambient air to, for your initial drying? It's just ambient air. I think the heated air wouldn't be good for the seeds. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Oh, 
But this is Mary Paul, Karen. Uh, so tomorrow when we go out, yeah, we'll probably tell this us tomorrow. Um, are we targeting, are we given a certain targets um, that we're actually looking, each person is looking for or how, how will it work? Yeah, so um, I found, uh, that's what I spent a lot of time doing this in the fall is just looking for what's ready, um, what has seeds in it. And um, like I said, this was a bad year for some species. So we're not even collecting them because it's not worth the time. But um, and then in each site, we're going to divide up into groups and we'll go to some different sites. And then um, there might be more than one person collecting the same thing. Um, but yeah, you, there's certain things that you'll collect and okay. there's, there's several options at each site. So you can switch to, if you get tired of collecting one thing, you can try something else. But <laughs> well, I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. Great questions. Really glad everybody's asking questions and I've been taking notes. I learn every time I listen to Karen and she does an amazing job for the refuge and working with volunteers. So it's always a pleasure to work with Karen and she really has a heart in it. And I don't know how she does all the work she does. So we really truly appreciate the volunteers supporting us. 